Our first reading this morning is from Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats, he seats them with princes, with the princes of their people. He settles the barren woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Praise the Lord. Please rise for the reading of our gospel. Taken from Luke 16, verses 1 through 15. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me in their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 400. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling world wealth, worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees, who loved money, heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Good morning. It's always a, uh, a delight to be in a place where things are well led, and I want to say thanks to our 
team who's been leading this morning. Um, God's presence is thick. Um, and it's a humbling place to follow, to be um, in a place where um, a sense that God is working is among us. And so here's what I'd like to do today is, um, well, first of all, I, I just want to, I'm going to make up for something that I didn't do in the early service. In the early service, I forgot to mention that there's a voters meeting right after this. So I'm going to mention it twice. Hopefully some of those people are online watching right now. There's a voters meeting at one o'clock today. Come back early for pizza. You all stay. Um, we're going to talk about the property to the west that uh, has served as a school and various things. Um, and that's the agenda. So stick around. Um, but what we've been doing for the last three weeks or so is talking about kind of various characteristics of the church. And we get to this, I guess I'd call it a perplexing parable. I remember about 30 years ago, I was reading through the Bible, doing one of those read through the Bible in a year programs, right? And I got to this passage and I wanted it to say something different. And you know how your mind can kind of fill in the blanks and you'll, you'll read into it what you want it to say. And I kept wanting to read into it that the master would be saying to the steward that he was condemning him. And I kept reading it that way because that seems like what should have happened, right? He should have been condemned because he was dishonest. But instead, it says he commended him. And I had the hardest time wrapping my brain around the difference between condemning and commending in this parable. It's an odd parable. And so what I want to do today is, first of all, just walk you back through the narrative. Pastor Steve read it well, but I'll add a little flavor to it to make it maybe a little bit more real. Um, and then I want to talk about the main point of the parable, and then I'll talk about how it applies to us, and I hope the Lord will show up in the midst of all of that. There is a, uh, a cartoon series, it's called Agnes Day, and this guy writes for whatever the assigned reading is, for that Sunday in a traditional church calendar, he always uses those, and he, and he does these cartoons, and I actually got kind of a kick or a giggle out of this one. He says, um, it's two different sheep talking. He says, you know, the par this parable always confuses me. Oh, you, we mean the steward cooks the books, and the pastor appears generous, and his social standing is enhanced? Yeah, cool. Can I borrow $100? Why? I'd like to enhance your social standing. So... <laughs> I'll be standing at the door with my hand out at the end of the service. No, no. Um, um, I do want to, uh, it's a perplexing story. It's, it's a weird story. And so let me just kind of walk you back through it real quick. Um, there's a rich guy. He's, he's wealthy enough that he hires people to look after his stuff. And so he's got a, a fund manager, you might say. He's got a COO, a chief operating officer, or a, a chief financial officer. He's got both of those guys wrapped up into this steward who's watching after the master's affairs. And so this guy has a lot of responsibility. He's got a high-level executive job. And he gets the authority to make decisions about things that pertain to the master's money. And he's been rolling along and doing pretty well. And finally, one day, the, the rich man comes to him and says, hey, um, I don't really like what's going on here. You're going to need to look for work elsewhere. And he kind of freaks out. And he goes, huh, this is a pretty sweet gig. I've been working with this guy's books, and, and I've been doing stuff, and, and I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm too old to go work out and dig ditches, and I'm too proud to, to turn into a beggar. I, ha, ha, I know what I'll do. I'll make those other people that I've been doing business with indebted to me so that when they see me coming, instead of going, oh, here comes that guy who's always ripping us off, hey, here's the guy who was generous towards us and wrote off a lot of our debts. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to win them over. And how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to forgive their debts. It's an interesting thing. There's, as, as I studied the commentators on this, there's really kind of two main theories. One just says it's straight up he was dishonest. But that doesn't seem entirely satisfying to me. Why would Jesus, if he was just straight up dishonest, wouldn't Jesus condemn him? Aren't we called to be honest and faithful and speak the truth? So some of the other commentators, they say stuff like this, and I'm not sure where it really stands, but I'm going to give you the theory. Um, that he actually would be, have been like a, 
You know how when you go to purchase stocks, for example, different stocks have different fee structures on them? And that this guy was actually kind of adding his own fees on top of the stuff, and he was adding exorbitant fees, like big fees, like half of the amount of interest. So, you know, the guy who um, got, had 800 in debt, and he forgave him and made it down to 400, that was all just his fees. That was a guy who was charging some usurious, outlandish kinds of fees. And it makes sense that he might have said, you know what, I'm going to forego the short-term gain, and I'm going to get the long-term gain by winning over the people. And so that's kind of the theory as to how I think about this, is, is probably enlightened by that sense. And Jesus commended him because he was wise. He gave up the short-term gain. He could have got the 400 bushels or the whatever. But instead, he says, you know what, I'm going to make this last a lifetime. They're going to be indebted to me. And they're going to treat me favorably because I've been excessively generous towards them. And so that way kind of makes sense that Jesus, but we don't know all the mores and the social structures and the business practices of that day, but that's kind of, to me, theory number one that works the best. But no matter what theory you kind of settle on, there's one main point, and Jesus makes it pretty abundantly clear that the main point is this. After he's done telling the parable, he says, here's the main point. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, when your money's dried up or when your other social capital is all gone, that you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Let me just unpack that for just a second. I think there's more than money that goes into this. There's, there's social status. How many Facebook followers do you have? Blah, 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 right? All of these different ways where we have, that person really has it going on. It's not just money, but that's one of the ways. Um, when all of that stuff, when, when all of your Facebook followers and all of your money goes away, what are you going to have left? Well, there's either going to be a big welcoming party for you at Heaven's Gate, or it's just going to be a lonely kind of a day. And what he's saying here is, if you want to have that kind of a welcoming party at heaven's gate, then you need to be generous now. You need to be outlandishly, lavishly, abundantly generous now. Because you win people over with your wealth. Now, just think about it for a second. Who in this room doesn't like it if somebody says, hey, why don't we go out for dinner, I'll buy, and we're going to a nice steak restaurant? Everybody's like... Yes. Well, unless you're a vegetarian, then you go, well, how about something else? But most of us would say, yes, I'm in on that. That's how you win friends. And what he's saying here, Jesus is saying, use your worldly wealth. I've given it to you. It's yours to use for what purpose? To just hoard it to yourself and go cloister off out in the, out in the boonies somewhere with nobody around you? No. I've given you this so that you can bring people into eternity with you and that they will be standing there at heaven's gate cheering you on saying, yes, here comes that generous guy who introduced me to the love of God, which was so generous. That's what I think this parable, this weird parable, is really all about. You know, in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, par this was paradise, right? And things were good. And God created, and it was good, and it was good. And it, when he created man, it was very good. But then he said, it is not good. Why? It's not good because it's not good for man to be alone. See, paradise is not fulfilled until the friendships are rounded out. Paradise by yourself isn't much of a paradise. And so when... God takes out Adam's rib and he breathes life into Eve. You know what Adam does? He goes, oh, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. You're the one who completes me. Now life is even better than it was in paradise because I've got somebody to share it with. That's what Jesus is saying here. Bring people into paradise with your generosity. Lavishly spend your emotional capital empathize with people, have compassion on people, do it with, through your social status, go with, take the outcast out to lunch and 
Bless them by your presence. Give away your cash. Forgive your debtors. All of those kinds of things are ways of being excessively generous. Because it is possible for people to be technically generous, do all the right things, but have a hard heart. I know people who give 10%, but who are not what I would call generous-hearted people. They're technically generous, but they're not necessarily heartfelt generous. So Jesus says, invest in things that matter. Invest and steward that which I have given you. The biggest thing that the Bible teaches about stuff is that you're not the owner. You know, that kind of my American upbringing kind of says stuff like this. Uh, I've worked hard. I earned it. It's mine. It's nobody else's. That's not the way the Bible talks about things. The Bible says, if you've got anything, it's a gift. Oh, but I went to school and I studied hard. Well, how did you get to, how did you get to the university? You know, I've been in lots of kind of places on the planet. And if I would have been born in those places, I wouldn't be here today, I guarantee you. If I were born in the village of Santiago Zamora, Guatemala, a place where I've been a number of times, I would not be here. If I were born in Chennai, India, in the slums, I would not be here. If I were born outside of Monterey, Mexico, in the rural area, I would not be here. Everything that I have is a gift. It's a gift from God. It's not something that I can claim and say, look at me, what I've done, yay, yay. No, it's all a gift. Your health, your education, your circumstances, your talents, your parents, your background, it's all a gift. It's not how great you are. The Bible claims that over and over again. And as a matter of fact, David, when they are dedicating Solomon's temple, listen to what David said. He said, but who am I? And who are these, my people, that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you. And we have only what has been given by your hand, O God. Everything is from him. It's a gift. Interestingly, in uh, Malachi, Malachi gets all up in the grill of the people of Israel. Listen to this. You rob God. Oh, the people say, how do we rob God? Malachi says this, in your tithes and offerings. He said, bring the whole tithe to the storehouse of God. They were cheating on their tithe. Now, it's an interesting thing. Sometimes people get all anxious about this and say, uh-oh, there goes preacher man talking about I got to give 10% of my income. I'm just going to tune out now. I know you're tempted, but listen just for a second. Pretend that you worked for, I don't even know if they're a company anymore, E.F. Hutton. Is that still around? I don't even know. Let's say, let's say Edward Jones. You work for Edward Jones and somebody comes to you and they say, I would like you to invest my million dollars. They're the owner and you're the steward. And they say to you, now, I only want 10% back. You keep the 900000 and I'll keep the 100000 Don't you think most people would be going, yeah, yes, greatest day ever. That's what God says to you and me. Keep 90%. I want 10% back. I'm the owner. I'm giving you 100% to work with. I just asked for 10% back at the end of the year. Now, I'm not bringing this as a crush you with the law kind of thing, because I know we're all at different places. But it is a goal to move towards. And the reason that I say that, it's for your benefit. I don't say this for the church's benefit. I say this for your spiritual benefit, because when you're investing in something that's bigger than you, you have a stake in it. God wants you to have a stake in this ministry. God needs people who have a stake in this ministry. Why? Because we are going to be a generous people who lavishly support and bring people into the kingdom. And there could be no higher calling than that. If you're not there, 
Maybe you go up 1%. Maybe you're at 2% and you go to 3%. Maybe you're at 3% and you go to 4%. I don't really care. It's for your benefit, not for mine. There is a blessing in being obedient to God's word in this. There just is. I've experienced it in my own life. When we were dirt poor, 10%. Not because I'm so smart, but because my wife had the checkbook. <laughs> totally true. Totally true. You're a fund manager, and you get to use 90% of the owner's funds on the way you live. Wow, what a great deal. Now, so when you, when you give, and by the way, other stuff counts too, I, but I would say this, I, I love things like the American Heart Association and Red Cross and stuff like that, but I, I think the 10% should go to places that declare the forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. That's different. I love the Teachers Association and what they do and the walk for the cure of Alzheimer's and all of that stuff. I, I love all that stuff, but that should come above and beyond. The 10%, the storehouse gift that Malachi was talking about is where you hear the forgiveness of sins and places that declare that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. That's the 10%. Above and beyond is awesome. But I want... Uh, I want you to give with eternity in mind. That's why I share that. Um, because eternity is what matters most. Everything else is going to fade. It just is. You know, like the steward, he forsook the short-term gains for a long-term thing. He invested in relationships. You know, this is kind of, I was thinking about this this week. Um, a lot of people put money into gold or real estate or stocks and bonds. I had a friend, um, and my, my wife would be the beneficiary of this because she loves good chocolate. And this guy would always go, and you know what he would do? He would take his cash to Switzerland and put it in a vault, and he would always bring back good chocolate from Switzerland. So every time he would go to Switzerland, my wife would get a like, really nice chocolate bar. You know who I'm talking about. Yeah, she does. She remembers him well, fondly, because of the chocolate. You know, he died a couple years ago. And I wasn't a part of the reading of his will, but I just have this feeling that that money's still in that vault. I don't know why I think that. I just think that. I think and feel it. I, I know people who were beneficiaries of his, but it wasn't lavish. And he had the opportunity to be lavish. What happened to that? He didn't take it with him. You don't take anything with you. So spend it while you're here so that people can hear the good news. That's what Jesus is saying. That's what this whole thing is about. Make heavenly investments in the king of, kingdom of God. Be generous. Be generous, not technically generous, but heartfelt, lavishly generous. There's a big difference. There's a guy named Mike Wilcox. He wrote a commentary on this passage. Um, and he says this. He says, although these things, property, your ability, your time, etc., belong to this life only, what will happen when you come to pass into the afterlife all depends on what you are doing in the present, in the here and now. Make sure that what you are doing will bring you into fellowship with others, and that will survive beyond your death. I like what he's saying there. He's saying that your whole life, at the end, it's just going to be a poof, unless you've spent it on relationships and building friendships. What he's saying is making money is not the source of your security. It's not the source of your significance but love is the source of your significance. Friendships, relationships are the source of significance. And the only way, or a tool, I should say, it's not the only tool, it's probably one of the lesser tools, but a tool to get people into a relationship with you, one another, and the Holy Spirit of God is through love, used in money. 
You know, 1 Corinthians 13 says the greatest of these is money. No, the greatest of these is what? Love. Yeah, the greatest of these is love. There's a, a pastor who ran around New England back in the 17th century. His name was Jonathan Edwards, and he, he wrote a sermon. You can Google it and look it up. I'll save you about 28 pages of reading by summarizing it in this way. Um, it, the, the sermon is called Heaven is a World of Love. And he's saying basically that there's five characteristics that we long for on this planet but will never really happen until the afterlife. Listen to what he says. We each, want to, we each long to be loved for our own sake. But he goes on and he explains, actually, most of us feel used on this planet by others. We don't feel like we're just loved for our own sake. We're, we're used as a means to an end by other people most of the time. And he says, in heaven, you will be loved for your own sake. And he says, we long, we, we want to be able to express love without impediment. But he says, because of our egos and our selfishness and because of the trivial way we look at things, we don't have that now. But then, then we will. He says, we want to be loved mutually. While we're walking this planet, he, he says, basically, we experience this inequality that um, we, we feel like we're pouring more into the other person always than they're pushing back to us. We long to have that feeling that we're mutually loved. And then he says, we all want to be at peace and happiness. And then I thought of the phrase that I've heard a number of people, wise friends who have had children say this. They say, you're never happier than your least happy child. <laughs> I don't know if it's true or not. I kind of think it is that you're never happier than your least happy child. We get so attached to the happiness of others that we get kind of enmeshed with them and we can't see straight. But he says there on the heavenly side of things, we'll be happy, we'll be at peace, we'll be at total contentment. And the last thing he says I think is pretty powerful. He says, we long to be loved without parting. We long to be loved without parting. You know, if you're married, one of you is going to go first and the other one's going to be left behind and there's going to be a deep hole, a sadness that's just reality because we experience separation, but in the new heavenly realm, we won't. There will be no more death. There will be no more sorrow. See, we always experience, while on this planet, heartache and sadness and disappointment. If C.S. Lewis, if I were trying to summarize what he said in the, the book of the Four Loves, he says, if you don't ever want a broken heart, don't love people. It actually is better if I just read you the quote. That's my summary. Here's a, here's a better way to listen closely. To love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung out and possibly smashed and broken. If you want to keep it intact, you must give it to no one. Not even an animal for a pet wants your heart. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and luxuries, but avoid all entanglements with creation. Lock it up safe in a casket or a coffin or selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, and motionless, it will change you. It will become unbreakable, your heart, impenetrable. To love is to be vulnerable. It's a good word we invest in heavenly things, we are going to make ourselves vulnerable. We're going to put ourselves out there. We're going to invite people to lunch, and sometimes they're going to make up excuses and act like they're too busy. We're going to put ourselves out there and love more deeply than we feel safe, because that's what God does for us. In the end of this story, um, well, at the start, Jesus says, hey, servant, I need an account of things. What's going on here? Seems like something's askew. And in the end, Jesus is calling out the Pharisees and he's saying, you justify yourself. He says this, you are the ones who justify yourself in the eyes of men, but God knows your heart and your heart is detestable to the Lord. 
See, there's going to be kind of a day of reckoning that comes for all of us, and there's going to be this moment where we're either trying to justify ourselves. This is the way Dietrich Bonhoeffer says it in the book Life Together. He says, self-justification and judging others, they go together. Justification by grace and serving others, they go together. See, we're either trying to prove ourselves and make ourselves big and act like we've got it all together and I've got money and I've got status and blah, 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 and look at me, or we're saying, you know what? I'm broken and I need a Savior. Which one does God want of us? I need a Savior. That's right. Um, when we're justified by grace, we're very broken. We have a heart of repentance and that heart of repentance, because God has done so much, he's lavished generously on us the love of his son. We receive that and we, we forward it. We pay it forward. That's what we do. That's what God's calling us to do today. Not to have any judgy better than us, but to actually kind of live like the Macedonians. The Macedonians were a people who were, um, this is in 2 Corinthians 8, Paul says this, the Macedonian churches, out of their severe trials and extreme poverty, they gave extremely generously, above and beyond their ability for the privilege of sharing in the gospel. They were dirt poor. They had nothing. And they gave everything they had to the widows back in Jerusalem because that was more important. I don't know what God's trying to say to you today, but I know he's kind of convicted me as I went through the business of preparing this message. And here's where we always need to land the plane. That your justification isn't about anything that you've done. As a matter of fact, if you are, then you're a Pharisee. Because you know what the Pharisees were about? Justifying themselves. Look at me, I give 10%. I offer really big, long prayers. I'm pretty cool in God's sight. That's what Jesus was saying. No, no, you're not. It's all a gift. Your whole life, it's a gift. Anything that you have, it's a gift. Give it back to him. Entrust it all to him. He is your justification. Hebrews 2 says it well, or Hebrews 12, 2 says it well. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him scorned the cross and its shame and then he sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus willingly and wantingly, he fixed his eyes on the cross and he went there. And we keep our eyes on him. And we live in a generous fashion as he's lived for us. We're going to confess um, the words of the Apostles' Creed. And in that Apostles' Creed, there's a whole section where we talk about Jesus, that he was crucified, died, was buried. It's a, that's a high price to pay, but he rose again. And we have an eternal victory that we get to invite people to. And so that's the party that God will have, and we will be a part of it, and it will be awesome. So I'm going to ask you to stand. As we say the creed, especially focus in on what Jesus has done for you, I'm going to um, invite you to say those words with me now boldly. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. And the third day he rose again from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead, and I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.